Okay, um, I think we're going to make a start. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for for coming. It's really nice to see everyone here. It's a lot of uh, familiar faces. Um, my my name is Oliver Cumming. Um, I'm based here at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine uh, in the Environmental Health Group, uh, which is really the bit of the London School that does uh, water sanitation and, and hygiene, all the things that we're going to be uh, talking about um, today. I'm also involved in the SHARE uh, research um, program, uh, which is a DFID uh, funded research program consortium uh, which funded uh, the work that's going to be presented um, today. Um, and if, if I could, I just want to draw your attention to three features of the SHARE research program because I think it's a fairly unusual uh, research program. The first thing is it's entirely focused on sanitation and hygiene. Uh, it's £10 million pounds, um, for five years of research, as I said, just on sanitation and hygiene. And at the time when that award uh, was made, it was really, um, it was really quite a brave uh, decision by DFID. There, wasn't, there weren't many checks for 10 million pounds being written for research just on sanitation uh, and hygiene. And you know, I think you know, Sandy, amongst others who've been uh, doing this for uh, a few years, uh, we're really surprised to see that volume of money going into the issue uh, of sanitation and hygiene, despite how important we know it is in terms of um, public health. The second thing that I want to draw your attention to uh, with regard to the SHARE program is that it's an unusual consortium which brings together both researchers and uh, implementers. Um, on the, implementation, on the um, implementing side, we have WaterAid, an international NGO uh, working in about 30 countries, uh, low-income countries, um, and you know, we're very lucky to have Girish here today, or maybe say a little bit about WaterAid's work. Um, also, we have Slum Dwellers uh, International, which is a, a global federation of uh, community groups um, that have federated at a, at a city and at a national uh, level. And then on the research side, we have the International Centre for Diarrheal Disease Research, Bangladesh, ICDDRB, um, and also the International Institute for Environment uh, and Development. And I want to just highlight that we have implementers and researchers together on a research programme, because this doesn't always happen. It's not always easy, but we came together as five organisations around, uh, I guess, sort of certain shared values. Um, in particular, there was an agreement across all five organizations at the outset that evidence is really, really important and research is really important. And then linked to that, secondly, that research needs to relate to the challenges on the ground. And researchers left alone don't always identify the most important uh, research questions or respond most directly to those challenges on the ground. Um, so I want to highlight this because the work you're going to hear about was jointly prioritised and identified by uh, one of the research partners within SHARE, the London School, and one of the implementing partners within SHARE, uh, Wartray, because it was jointly identified as a priority. Okay. So tonight, as I said, we're going to hear a little bit about uh, the linkages between WASH uh, and undernutrition, or particularly childhood uh, undernutrition. Uh, for those of you, um, uh, you know, who sort of sit in the WASH sector, this is really a hot, a hot topic. There have been a, you know, a lot of interesting studies published in the last um, couple of years using sort of different methods, different approaches. Um, there are some very large studies underway that I know Alan is going to touch on briefly. Um, but it's also a rather old preoccupation. Um, Edwin Chadwick, when he was first making the case for investment in sanitation here in the UK, actually, uh, uh, as, uh, for his argument, sanitation was a means of getting waste out of the city, not to prevent uh, infectious disease, but to get that waste out of the city for agricultural uh, use in order that food could then be brought back in the city to improve the nutritional status of the working classes. Um, so this is, in a way, a sort of an old, uh, something of an old theme or uh, preoccupation. The last thing I want to say is that it's a boundary issue. This is a, this is a research topic and a policy question that sits between two sectors, the WASH uh, sector and the nutrition um, sector. And it's maybe because it's a boundary issue that it has been uh, sort of possibly ov overlooked uh, in, the last, uh, in the last few, few years. Um, what I'm very pleased 
about uh, today is that we have representatives from both of those sectors in this room hopefully going to participate in this discussion and particularly with our panel we have uh, both sectors uh, represented and personally I have to say working with um, working with Alan it's been uh, and the other members of the team that are involved in the re review it was a it was a really interesting experience uh, I've learned a lot about uh, nutrition and the many strange terms that they uh, that they use and I think Alan uh, has probably learned a thing or two about um, uh, pit latrines and septic tanks and various other exciting uh, things along the way. Lastly there will be refreshments about 6.30 but we expect you to work for them. We expect when uh, when we heard from the, the speakers, heard from the panellists that we're going to have some input from you, uh, the audience. We really want to get a discussion going. So as you're listening to the presentation, you're listening to the panellists, do think of questions or issues that you want to bring to uh, this discussion. If everybody works very hard, uh, there will be uh, refreshments at 6.30. Um, okay, I'm going to introduce um, Alan. He's a senior lecturer here at the London uh, School in uh, Nutrition. Uh, and he also works at DFID, um, interestingly, uh, as a, I don't know what your title is, your senior, senior research fellow in nutrition and agriculture. Um, so Alan's, I suppose, relatively unique in that he's a, um, a, 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 an academic who has, who is now flirting with the policy uh, sphere uh, successfully, I, um, I think. Uh, but he was also the lead author of this review. Um, so, uh, without any sort of further ado, I'd like to, uh, if you could all welcome uh, Alan. So, I've been called um, interesting and unique, so that's something to live up to. Interesting is what you call your great aunt's cake. <laughs> Um, right, thank you, Ollie. Lovely, very grateful uh, for that lovely introduction. I'm delighted to be here to uh, to have the UK launch. I was invited to to launch our Cochrane Review. We published it a few months ago, but then some holidays happened. So, um, and it's great to have such a full house to present the findings. As Ollie says, um, this is really a, a boundary issue, and and this is the sort of work that I, I love to do, crossing across from one sector to another. So in this sense from the WASH sector into the nutrition and health sector. Um, in my work in DFID, I cross from nutrition, uh, from agriculture into nutrition and health. So it's really important, I think, that we work much harder to cross these boundaries, to work intersectorally, uh, to answer some of these really, really important questions. So I'm going to present the work of a group of people, and I'll introduce the group uh, a little bit later on. Um, but it really came about following discussions with, uh, with Sandy, uh, who, uh, um, actually I've got to tell a story. Uh, my son came in, uh, it was half term last week, and my son, my little son came in, to, and we had fish and chips in the refectory. And Sandy was in the refectory as well, and I said, oh gosh, look, there's Sandy, he's really, really famous. And was fine. So and my little son, who's eight, didn't really care. Anyway, but we went, <laughs> but then we went home, and he said to his, el to his elder brother, who's nine, uh, do you know Sandy? <laughs> <laughs> it was brilliant. Anyway, I love working with Sandy, but it's been a fantastic experience working with Ollie and Sandy and learning so much new. So I'm really, I'm going to talk um, really about the linkages between nutrition, uh, a wash and nutrition. And as, as Ollie says, it, it's not hugely new and it shouldn't be hugely surprising. So what do we know about undernutrition? We know that uh, currently the estimates are, the 2011 estimates are that there are 52 million children under the age of five who are wasted, which means they are significantly thinner than they should be, so they're dangerously thin. Uh, we know that there are 165 million children uh, globally uh, under the age of five who are stunted, which means they are much shorter than they should be. So what are the consequences of being, of being thin or short? Well, we know from very good evidence that being thin and being short increases your risk of mortality, so the risk of child mortality, and also significantly increases your risk of susceptibility to infections and other uh, infectious diseases and other forms of illness. That's in the short term, but we also know in the long term the consequences of stunting particularly uh, are, are very dramatic and very, uh, very uh, uh, serious. So uh, stunted children um, have lower educational achievement, they do less well at school, they, they have fewer years of education, uh, which of course means that uh, they, they, it reduces their likelihood of getting a good job and being economically productive in later life or, or in, decreases their economic productivity in later life. 
And we also know that stunted children grow into short adults um, who are less, uh, uh, have lower work capacity and therefore less, less able to, to earn, earn, earn income. Um, you know, and we also know, of course, that within populations, within countries where there are large numbers of people, uh, uh, children who grow up to be short and stunted uh, adults, uh, this has a dramatic impact on the, on the economic development of those countries. So what are the causes of undernutrition? Well, um, this is a conceptual framework that was first drawn up by UNICEF in the late 80s, uh, early 90s, and it, it identified the sort of distal causes uh, um, at the bottom there of undernutrition, things like uh, uh, family and control of resources and income poverty. The more, uh, the more uh, immediate causes, uh, such as household food security, social care environment and health environment, and then the, the, the absolute underlying causes, the, the inadequate food intake and disease. And we know that these, uh, these the inadequate food intake and disease are really the direct causes of undernutrition. And we know that uh, you know, children who don't eat enough food and children who have repeated episodes of infection, infectious disease are more likely to become undernourished. And we, but we also know that there are a set of specific interventions um, such as the promotion of breastfeeding, uh, some certain types of uh, vitamin and mineral supplementation, which will reduce the risk of, of undernutrition. And the estimates from the Lancet series, which was published in, in, in June this year, uh, the latest Lancet series on return and carbon nutrition, published in June this year, um, show very clearly that implementation of this set of nutrition interventions um, at scale would reduce stunting, stunting globally by one third and under five mortality by about a quarter. Now that's a fantastic thing, but of course it does leave two thirds of stunting un unaddressed and three quarters of under five, mort under five mortality also unaddressed. So we recognize obviously that there are other interventions that, are tackled, that must be broader to tackle the, the, the remaining burden. And these will of course include things that I'm interested in like agriculture, but also social protection and uh, for the purposes of today's talk, obviously the really fundamental importance of WASH. So what is the evidence on WASH, uh, the, the availability of water sanitation and hygiene um, globally? Uh, earlier this year, DFID put out an evidence paper which synthesized the available evidence uh, on, on, on WASH. And the numbers are rather frightening. Two and a half billion people do not have access to improved sanitation. 780 million people do not have access to an improved water supply. And diarrhea is the cause of nearly three, more than three quarters of a million child deaths per year. There's also the, the, the evidence report also makes a, the, the strong statement, which is largely uh, substantiated by evidence, that there's good evidence that inadequate wash contributes substantially to uh, diarrheal disease mortality burden. So there's very big, big, you know, there's, a, there's obviously a problem with wash globally. There's insufficient provision of good, good wash, and we know that uh, poor, poor sanitation and hygiene is associated with increased risk of, of diarrhea, and diarrhea is a major cause of death in children. So um, that's the link between water sanitation, hygiene, and diarrhea or infectious disease. What about the link between diarrhea and stunting? How good is the evidence there? Well, we know that diarrhea and stunting are associated. Children who, have, who are stunted have more diarrhea. But what we don't know is the, direct, the, the direction of that relationship. So does diarrhea cause poor nutritional status or does poor nutritional status increase the risk of diarrhea? So it's very difficult to unpick the causality there. But in 2008, a very important study published by Checkley, in, uh, I, uh, I think in the International Journal of Epidemiology, looked at uh, nine different studies which had daily diarrhea mortality data excuse me, morbidity data, and longitudinal anthropometry uh, uh, information. And showed that, um, so they were therefore able to look at the, the timing of the diarrhea and the timing of the growth and, and, and the growth outcomes. And they showed that the odds of stunting, so the odds of becoming a short child, a, a very short child at 24 months, were significantly increased. Uh, for every five episodes of diarrhea. So children who had uh, repeated episodes of diarrhea um, over the first 24 months of their life were much more likely to become stunted by the age of 24 months. So this is, of course, uh, uh, consistent with the hypothesis that the direction is a uh, child gets diarrhea, that, that uh, significantly affects their growth performance, and the child then will become stunted. 
so, so that makes that link. That makes the link for us between the wash sector and the nutrition and health outcome. So when we started this work, we decided, first of all, to draw a large conceptual framework. And in fact, if you look at the publication, uh, it's a very large conceptual framework. And Cochrane were rather cross that it didn't fit on the page. But uh, uh, we had to shrink it. Um, and we, we, we first of all started looking at the direct linkages between WASH and nutritional status. And we've identified these three pillars at the top there, poor sanitation, poor water quality, and poor hand washing. And we said that those things were more likely to increase the fecal contamination uh, in the home and of the food in the home. And then, uh, we know, as we've already discussed, uh, fecal contamination increased, uh, poor wash is more likely, it leads to increased risk of diarrhea. And there are also, and also increased risk of nematode infections and worm infection, uh, infection, uh, in, infection from the food. But also there is, of course, as many of you will know, this, this emerging hypothesis on environmental enteropathy, uh, which is the uh, damage caused to the gut, um, resulting in guts which are less able to absorb nutrients and, uh, and guts which are leaky and therefore allow pathogens to cross into the body. Uh, and this is a theory which is currently being investigated, um, but there is, there is emerging evidence to suggest that this is also a major a route um, through which WASH may impact on nutrition and nutrition outcomes. So we have those three, those, 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 the direct linkages then between the WASH interventions uh, and nutrition outcomes. But of course, there are also many indirect linkages between uh, WASH and, uh, and nutrition status. And of two of the main ones I put up here, um, uh, if the water is a long way away, then of course the mothers typically will be out collecting water rather than look at home looking after their children or preparing food or farming or whatever it is, and that will uh, may significantly impact on, on nutritional status of children. And similarly, if the water is expensive, living in urban environments where you have to buy your water, um, then there's less money available for food or other health problems uh, or other public goods. So there are both direct and indirect linkages that are important to bear in mind. We pulled together a team to, uh, to, to, to try and answer this question um, in, in our Cochrane review. And the team is, uh, uh, contains people from multiple different disciplines, but also uh, different sectors. Um, so uh, um, first of all, of course, it contains Ollie, and, uh, who, is, who is here at school, but also um, colleagues from WaterAid, Yael, and Sue, Yael Velleman and Sue Cavill. Um, uh, much of the work was done by my research fellow, uh, Louise Watson, who sadly isn't here today. Um, but, um, but, and, but we also had very high level nutrition input from Ricardo Wowie, who's a professor of nutrition at the school and a leading figure in nutrition, especially in undernutrition, and uh, high level statistical analysis support from Elizabeth Allen. So it was a, a team that covered both the WASH, uh, the academic disciplines, but also uh, brought in civil society. So I was delighted that when we brought together the team, and the, the review focused very clearly on the direct linkages between WASH, uh, the, the, so interventions that improve water quality and supply, sanitation and hygiene practices, and their effect on nutritional status in children globally. So it was a systematic review with meta-analysis. And I just want to say one line about systematic reviews. They are really, really, really important evidence-generating tools. And uh, you know the days are gone, I think, when you can sit down and do an armchair review and just pull out the papers of your favorite authors. Um, you know, this is the way to conduct robust evidence. This is new evidence. Uh, journals will accept this. These aren't review articles. This is evidence. This is research evidence. And the advantage of systematic reviews is that they, uh, you're able to estimate the strength of the evidence from the totality of the available data. This reduces bias because you're not just picking the papers you want to do, you want to, you want to review. And also, if you include meta-analysis, you're able to pro provide a more robust estimate or more, a more precise estimate of any effect. So we conducted a systematic search that, looked, that included all types of WASH interventions. We included um, any study from any country uh, that included children under the age of 18. We looked in six English online databases and three Chinese online databases, or I should have mentioned our Chinese collaborator, apologies. Um, uh, but we looked in books, we looked in conference reports, we spoke to authors, and that was 
absolutely critical speaking to authors because we, as I'll say later, we, they gave us quite a lot of unpublished data. The primary outcomes for the review were weight for height, which is, as you know, a measure of uh, uh, the indicator used for wasting, and height for age, uh, the indicator used for stunting. And we also had secondary outcomes, which included height and weight for any other nutritional outcome, like there was one study which measured hemoglobin and a few other one study measured, one study measured middle upper arm circumference, any other secondary outcome we could identify. Uh, the review included 14 studies from 10 countries, and you'll see they're all low and middle income countries um, uh, from a good spread, some from Asia, some from Africa, um, and one from, one, two from, uh, from Latin America. The study duration was between six months and five years, and the total sample size of children included in, the, in, 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 in these 14 studies was uh, 9,500. All of the children in the study were under five years of age, so there's no evidence on children over the age of five years of age. And when we reviewed the 14 studies and judged them against the quality criteria of Cochrane, which, which has a, a set of criteria about whether or not the studies are good quality or not good quality, uh, none of the studies was considered to be of high quality. And this is largely because Cochrane has a criterion that uh, the study has to be double blind. Now, it's rather difficult to blind a pit latrine to, 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 to interventions and control arms. You either have it or you don't, and generally, if you have a pit latrine in your front room, you know about this. Yeah? So, uh, so there are, so, so Cochrane in this, so, so Cochrane can be rather rigid, and in this I instance, you know, all studies were graded as low quality, and often that was because of this necessity for the study to be a double blind trial. But the, study, uh, the, the studies that were included also had multiple different study designs. So we had randomized cluster randomized control trials. We also had follow-ups of cluster randomized control trials. We had longitudinal studies with control groups. We had repeat cross-sectional studies with control groups. We had controls before and after studies. And we ha even had one study which was cross-sectional with an intervention and a historic control group matched by percentage score matching. So I learned quite a lot about epidemiological study design. Um, but uh, this, um, as you can imagine, also complicates the way uh, the analysis was done. So moving on, oh, and the interventions, of course, similarly, multiple, multiple different interventions. And the studies included between one and four of these interventions. Several of the interventions looked at the quality of the water, water with bleach, water with flocculent disinfectant or solar disinfection, the provision of protected water. Others looked at sanitation, sanitary, sanitation education, and the construction of sanitary facilities. And others looked at hygiene, the provision of soap, or the promotion of hand washing. So I'm going to present two different types of meta-analysis, and I just wanted to identify that they tell us they they it's a, they tell us slightly different things. Um, Cochrane strongly advises that you shouldn't mix your study designs in your meta-analysis. So our meta-analysis was therefore only conducted on the study designs of which we had the most of, which was uh, cluster randomized controlled trials, which is of course the robustest form of evidence as well, the most robust. Um, and we conducted two forms of meta-analysis. One was a study level analysis, where we, uh, we looked at the mean difference between trial arms at the end point of the study. And so we included the final data, the final mean data points by trial arm from the, from the cluster randomized control trials. And there were five cluster randomized control trials. So the N of that meta-analysis is five, because there are just five studies. You put them in as means and you calculate the, 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 the average effect. So the mean of that is five, the sample size is five. We also conducted the much more rigorous and robust uh, IPD analysis, individual participant data analysis, where, what you, where, we, where you get the raw data from the five studies, and you look at the change in your outcome of interest between study baseline and endpoint, allowing for age, sex, and duration of study, or any other variable you want to include. And if you have the raw data, of course, it changes your sample size from five, to, which is the five studies, to five and a half thousand, which is the number of children. So we have a much more robust data set to conduct statistical analysis on. So finally, what did we find? 
in the meta-analysis that looked at the evidence that uh, wash, uh, the evidence for an association between wash and weight for height, change in weight for height, we found no evidence that wash changed weight for height. So I'm going to explain the graph just for those of you that don't know. Um, the five studies are, are listed on the, on, on, the, on the far left there, and you can see that because one of the studies, the Luby study, had several arms, we had to present it in a slightly complicated way, but basically there are five studies there. Then there's the mean difference for each of those studies between the intervention and the control arm at the end of the study. And these, this plot here is called the forest plot. Uh, the point here is the point estimate. What is the mean difference? And this is the 95% confidence interval around that mean difference. Um, and this bar here is the average of those points above. And what you can see is that the average falls exactly on the line of no difference, on, on, the, point, on the point of no difference. So the intervention neither favors, favors the intervention nor favors the control. So this is analysis which suggests that WASH has no effect on weight for height, and it's analysis including five cluster randomized control trials with more than four, which involved more than 4,500 children aged under five years. When we looked at the evidence on wash, um, whether wash changed height for age, so that's the linear growth of children, we found a suggestive evidence that from these studies, the same studies, that, um, that wash uh, improved uh, linear growth in children. It's a small improvement, that is 0.08 Z scores. Z scores are standard deviation scores, so about 0.1 standard deviation scores. Um, but that confidence interval doesn't, well, touches zero, um, um, so it's, well, it's, it's suggestive evidence. So that's the study level uh, um, meta-analysis. We also conducted, as I said, IPD analysis, which was the five studies, uh, the five uh, uh, co uh, cluster randomized control trials, which contained, and the analysis contained 5,300 5, 5, children. Again, we found no evidence in this analysis. This is adjusting now for baseline values, adjusting for age, sex, and duration of the intervention. We found no evidence that WASH improved weight for height, but we found a stronger evidence that WASH improved height for age with a mean difference of 0.11 Z scores. Um, and this, in our secondary outcomes, we also, as you would expect, found that, that uh, uh, WASH improved height uh, by about half a centimeter, and if you improve the height of a child, you would hope that you would also improve their weight. And we have their suggestive evidence, I would say, that uh, that WASH improved the weight of these children. The confidence interval does cross zero, but only just, and I, I'm quite happy to call that suggestive evidence. It makes sense. So what's our interpretation? My final slide, our interpretation is this is the first systematic review to look across these sectors, across from WASH all the way to nutrition outcomes. We've identified a reasonable number of studies and we've identified a large number of children, 5,500 children in the meta-analysis is quite a lot. We, there are concerns about the quality of some of these studies and, uh, and, and some of those concerns have been written up in journals, but they are, they are but they, that's the evidence base we have at the moment. And I think we would, we would say that there is suggestive evidence that the WASH intervention slightly improved linear growth in children. We know, as Oli alluded to earlier, that there are some very large trials currently underway in Bangladesh, India, and Zimbabwe that we will add to these to the meta-analysis when they're available, um, and we hope that that will provide a more definitive answer. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks for that, Alan. I hope um, I saw some, I saw some, some, some people sort of wondering what you know N and Z scores and so on are. But um, I mean, hopefully, over the course of the discussion, we're we're going to bring some clarity here as to what this all means for sort of policy uh, and practice. Um, I think some people maybe at the end of it are thinking, so what? And hopefully, we can come back, you know, to you in particular, but also the panel to ask ask that, that question. Um, the next person we're going to hear from is uh, Anna Taylor. Um, Anna is a, a senior nutrition advisor at the UK Department uh, for International uh, Development. Uh, Anna is a senior, uh, um, where she provides uh, policy advice and support uh, to the scaling up of the UK's uh, multi-sectoral program to tackle undernutrition. Um, for me, sort of someone who does a bit of work with, with DFID uh, now and then, Anna is always the person 
person that when I speak to my colleagues in the WASH team, they say, oh, don't talk to us, you need to speak to Anna, Anna Taylor. Um, so it's very nice to have you here um, today, Anna. And um, yeah, please, if you could come up here and maybe if you could give your um, uh, reflections and then take a seat on the panel. Thanks very much, Oli. Um, it's really great to be here and great to see so many people. Um, before I launch in, I'd really like to know who's actually here. So, Oli, if you could indulge me a moment and stick your hand up if, you're, if you consider yourself to be a kind of wash, focus on wash in your work. Okay, and nutrition? Okay, so quite balanced. And both? Ooh, hooray! A few. <laughs> um, neither. I, none of those. Okay, just one or two. Okay, great. So we've got quite a mixed audience, and um, which is really great. So uh, I think there's there's lots of scope for good discussion about how we make better connections between the two areas of work. Um, as um, Ollie said, I work on on policy, so I really wanted to make um, three main policy-related points. The first is around evidence and the, the evidence that's been presented here and particularly how it relates to policy um, coming from the nutrition perspective. Um, and I wanted to really thank um, Alan and the, other, the rest of the wider team work, who worked on the systematic review. It's a really great piece of work and a, a very significant contribution to the thinking around what works in nutrition. And I was quite struck when I was rereading it yesterday to prepare for today, I was thinking, I, I was, had been also reviewing in the last um, few weeks another systematic review which DFID is funded on um, complementary feeding and its impact on child growth. And when you look at the quality of the evidence available in comparison to comparing those two systematic reviews, we've got a much better quality of evidence here within the WASH work than we do in complementary feeding, which is kind of surprising given that you know, it's a sort of one of those, sort of the heart of what you'd consider to be a nutrition intervention. Um, much smaller sample sizes, fewer RCTs, um, really a, a much weaker evidence base to, to go from. So I think it's a, um, a credit to the people working on WASH that we've got this this quality of evidence available um, and also that we've got some really big trials which are soon to still report. Um, the SHINE one in Zimbabwe which Alan referred to um, and a big one in India both of which DFID is supporting actually but which we're really kind of excited about seeing how those will contribute further to this, this evidence base. Um, but I think as a challenge, which I've already given to Alan, is to, to take this evidence now and put it into the context of the range of nutrition interventions which are being discussed internationally and being scaled up through the Scaling Up Nutrition movement, which I'm sure many of you know is a multi-stakeholder partnership internationally um, to get nutrition much higher up the policy agenda and invest in the things which work to tackle undernutrition. And the, the Lancet series which came out in the summer, unfortunately doesn't, because of the timing issues, reflect this body of data. And we really need that wash data within the modelling which has been done for the Lancet series so it becomes one of the list of well, currently 10, hopefully soon to be 11 mm -hmm. interventions which are we you know within the, the body of evidence and, and we can you know look at the modelling in terms of impacts on stunting and mortality which Alan presented at the beginning. It's really important because I think we can't underestimate the policy impact of things like the, the, the in nutrition the, the Lancet Nutrition series has been incredibly powerful for helping to um, inform um, uh, investments um, at international and, and national level. Um, so I think it's really important to, to, to make those connections. Secondly, I think we've got a really big um, policy opportunity at the moment. Um, I'm speaking really principally from, from the nutrition side here, but we've got two areas which have been historically very neglected in terms of investment. And we've got a billion hungry people, we've got a billion people um, without access to any kind of toilet, close to a billion without access to clean water. I mean, we've got big challenges, global challenges of similar proportion, which has been historically quite neglected. And I think that's changing. It's certainly changing um, on, on nutrition this year has marked a really big turnaround in the level of international commitment to tackling undernutrition. There was a, um, uh, an event which the UK co-hosted under the G8 presidency this year, which was focused on really trying to build political commitment to tackle undernutrition. 
and why this presents a politi uh, policy opportunity for the for the WASH nutrition connection is because the nutrition agenda is very broad and very multi-sectoral and at several points people have referred to nutrition as being a sector. It's, we're, nutrition people do not see nutrition as a sector. We see nutrition as an outcome which many sectors contribute to and I think there's a, there's a real spirit within the nutrition community about trying to build linkages with other sectors to try and maximise impacts on undernutrition. And uh, I think what's happening in nutrition creates a really big opportunity for WASH nutrition linkages. And in the event in June, which I talked about under the G8 presidency of the UK, we, that we secured £12.5 billion pounds worth of commitments for nutrition sensitive interventions, of which WASH is a major one. So I think there's, there's a real, there's an interest from many governments, there's an interest from many donors, scientists and, and the like, to really make these connections stronger. And I think a, now is the moment to really seize that, seize that opportunity. Um, this is trying to do its bit. Um, we've, we've got um, a number of programs where we're trying to really make the connections between WASH and nutrition, um, thinking about how we can focus WASH interventions on the first 1,000 days of life, how we can track nutritional outcomes through our WASH investments. And a, pro a number of programs, DRC, Yemen, Ethiopia, Sierra Leone, a number of countries where we're really trying to, to do this. But this moves on to my third point, and that's the policy challenge, which I think is how we realise the, the connections in practice and in terms of delivery. And um, th that's the, the hard bit, you know, actually bringing the different sectoral people around the same table and thinking about the, the individual mother or child that's a recipient of multiple different inputs from multiple different sectors which don't necessarily talk to one another or coordinate very well. And, we are thinking often about delivery platforms completely in isolation from one another as different people working in different sectors. And I think that's the challenge. How do we, how do we really um, think about this challenge in a much more integrated way? It doesn't necessarily mean we need integrated programs. It might be just co-locating programs. I was very interested. I read yesterday in um, ACF, Action Against Hunger, have produced their annual report, Hunger Matters, and they've, they're now... It, they've basically showcased a whole raft of new programming where they're co-locating their WASH and their nutrition programs in the same place to really try and get these synergistic effects. Because we know that while these effects are relatively small, um, and even the effects in the whole of the Nutrition Lancet series are relatively small, they're only impacting on one third of stunting, even if you do all of them. We know that countries that have successfully tackled undernutrition, like Brazil, have had incredibly rapid reductions by investing in multiple sectors all at once and, and creating this kind of synergistic effect and a very strong focus on the poorest people and making sure that the, you know, the, the interventions reach the poorest. So there's a big opportunity there, um, not least with, with demonstrating those effects through the evidence, but also in actually making it happen at scale um, and, and making these delivery pl platforms connect. That's all I wanted to say. Thanks. Um, people have been pointing at the lights. Um, I'm not sure if one... Um, is it that the light... You'd like the lights to be brighter or...? Yeah, I think we have one. Yeah. Dark. This is well beyond my... Uh, you got any idea how... Mm. Okay, so, is that too bright? That's too, too bright. <laughs> the lights on us are very bright. The lights on okay. you are very dim. I'll try and find out how to control the okay. controlling these, oh, yeah. not those. It seems to be dimming without any... No. <laughs> Okay, too bad. You. You I think the most important thing is the comfort of our audience, so I'm, I'm going to dim me with apologies to our distinguished panel. <laughs> oh no, oh. Jane, is it going down? Good enough? Oh, okay. Yeah. Obviously, bright lights is not very flattering uh, for me, at least. Um, 
before introducing the panelists, Anna, that, that, that was great. I think you reminded us some really important uh, things. One is that whilst the evidence uh, that Alan presented may, may, look, may look thin, in other comparable uh, uh, interventions and areas, you're facing similar challenges on the, on the evidence uh, base. The other thing is you brought some new language, which I guess is a sort of language from the nutrition side, albeit not a cohesive uh, sector, which is uh, nutrition sensitive uh, interventions. And I think that's a, a word you're, you're starting to hear a lot, or a term you're starting to hear a lot more within the WASH sector as the WASH sector becomes more familiar with uh, what's happening on nutrition. And then the last point, which is, I think is a good link um, to, to Girish's The Sun uh, initiative, where it does seem like at a global level you've really got the coordination uh, that's been lacking uh, from the global level down to the national uh, level. I'm next going to introduce uh, Girish uh, Menon, he's a friend and former, former colleague. Uh, he's also the Director of International Programs uh, at WaterAid uh, and Deputy Chief um, Executive. Uh, Girish uh, heads WaterAid's International Program Department, so I think covering about 30 countries, low-income countries um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, South Asia, and I think in Southeast Asia now um, as well. Um, Girish joined WaterAid in, in January 2005 and actually came from uh, DFID, um, uh, where he's working uh, in India as a social development um, advisor. Just an anecdote, I was sitting next to Girish at the Sakosan uh, conference in Delhi in 2008, which is the South Asian Ministerial Conference on Sanitation. And uh, after Manmohan Singh, the Prime Minister of India, had spoke, there was a very eminent Indian nutritionist uh, who spoke, and he basically um, harangued the audience, who were sort of washed people, and said, you need to be doing more about the nutrition problem in India. And Girish turned to me and said, we need to be doing more about the nutrition problem uh, in, in India. So um, Girish, uh, I'd like to invite you up. Maybe you can tell us about what you and uh, your colleagues at Wartrade are doing about the nutrition problem. <laughs> Thank you very much, Oli, and absolutely no pressure on that. I was quite, I was quite happy with the, the lights here because I thought it's nice to be in the dark for a bit and have the lights on the audience, but never mind. Uh, it's been a trip of history, actually, uh, Oli mentioning about the Sacrosan, and I'm just back from the Sacrosan with a couple of other colleagues in the audience. The, 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 this year's Sacrosan was held two weeks ago in Kathmandu. Uh, but I'm also looking at my esteemed former colleague, Stephen Turner, out there. And I remember several years ago, Stephen told us about the need to have really good evidence. And at that time, my, my practitioner skepticism was, don't people really understand why wash is important? Do you really need evidence? And Stephen kept on banging the table and said, no, you really need good evidence. And there's something called the Cochrane Review, and you really need to understand the, the need to have that body of evidence. And, and, and it took some time for Stephen to convince us. Uh, and obviously, Ollie was there in, that, in the team at that point in time. And I'm really delighted to be here in this room because a few years ago, I remember I was here for the launch of the SHARE initiative when Stephen O'Brien, the then minister responsible for human development from DFID was here. And it was really an exciting time. So much money being invested just in getting that evidence between WASH uh, and, and its impact on sanitation uh, and, and its impact on, on health and nutrition. Uh, since you mentioned uh, about Sacrosan, I was also reminded of some of the discussions that were held where a number of government delegations, ministers, civil society, international organizations have very clearly now recognized that nutrition and health is really important. And it was very encouraging to see references to nutrition and health in the Kathmandu Declaration. And I think it's, it's really great to have the political commitment on that side. But as we all know, political commitment alone is not enough. One of the big challenges we have in the countries that we work in is about how do we get other departments, other ministries, and the, and the wider governments involved in this discussion. I'm also reminded when Alan actually came to War Trade uh, possibly last year to talk about this study, and again, there was a wave of excitement in our office, and many of our colleagues were, uh, are, are here who are there in that discussion. So it's really great to see where it has come to and where the evidence is so clearly uh, uh, positioned in favor of that link. Uh, you talked about the wash and nutrition boundaries, and I think if Robert Chambers were here, he would have used the food security boundary to actually say that a lot of discussion around food security is about what goes in rather than what comes out. And unless the world focuses on what comes out, 
we will not actually address the issues on food security because the food needs to be digested and it needs to be converted to solid health outcomes. So I think that's the context that really excites me about the discussions today and, and I obviously don't need to go to the evidence but one thing that I picked up at Sacrosan since Robert Chambers was there, was also this whole discussion on sanitation and stunting that Dean Spears, uh, Spears from the Rice Institute has been talking about. He's been talking about the India-Africa differential, where India on an average is a richer country than Africa as a continent, yet children in Africa are taller than, uh, than India. And one reason is largely attributed to high levels of open defecation in India, which is 600 million people, which is roughly 60% of the population. Uh, and it's not just the numbers, but it's also the, 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 the spread and, and, and the prevalence and the density of population. There's a lot in here which I haven't digested myself, but, uh, but when I told Robert that I'll be coming for this event, uh, Robert did ask me to, to talk about this increasing evidence as well. So it's all adding to that body of evidence and trying to get the different uh, uh, I shouldn't say sectors, as Anna said, but uh, different interest groups working together towards those integrated health outcomes. Uh, food security, obviously WASH has a very integral role to play on food security because one, it's a determinant to availability of food. Uh, water is absolutely important. Uh, we've seen that where small-scale water projects have taken off, they actually promote small-scale farming, uh, kitchen garden, all of which is actually fundamental to put more food in the mouth. But equally, it's also about improved utilization and more efficient utilization of food. Um, because it's about how do you also practice safe sanitation, how do you practice safe hygiene, so that overall the impact is immense. Um, now, you asked me a question of how we are trying to work together in terms of water and nutrition, and I think it's still quite early days for water aid. Uh, it is an opportune time for us when, as an organization, we are exploring the links between wash and health and nutrition, and I'm delighted that we have colleagues like Yale and Sue in the room as well, uh, who have also contributed to Alan's work. Uh, but. Uh, the, the, the key message that we are promoting is that of integration, of how wash and nutrition, uh, how the links cannot be ignored, and how integrated approach to nutrition is absolutely essential. And what we are trying to promote is what, on, on an approach that focuses on joint planning, joint financing, and joint delivery. And I totally agree with Anna that you know we need to look at nutrition as an outcome. And, and, and the idea is to promote the message that nutrition sensitive programs are those that focus on nutrition as an outcome and not just as an activity or, or in terms of promoting, for example, provision of more food. There are three things that WaterAid is currently doing in terms of trying to bridge the gap and work together with the nutrition sector. One is obviously on contributing to the evidence base, and we were delighted to have been part of the shared discussion, but also working with the Lund School of Hygiene and the Gates Foundation to deliver a large-scale sanitation trial, which will examine the impact of sanitation on health outcomes uh, such as stunting, diarrhea, and worm infections. The second thing is on about how do you promote better advocacy and partnerships. Uh, there's a huge opportune moment right now with discussions on post-2015. We've been actively working at the national level and at the global level, not just with the WASH-related sectors, but sectors uh, such as health and nutrition, trying to, on one hand, seek a standalone goal for WASH, but equally working with colleagues in the health sectors and nutrition sectors, talking about uh, an explicit mention and focus on WASH as a key determinant, uh, determinant to improve health and nutrition outcomes. And in terms of programmatic work, there's some exciting developments in Bangladesh where we are working on a large USAID funded program in southwestern Bangladesh working four districts which has high, high incidence of water related diseases and poor nutrition outcomes where WASH is seen, our contribution obviously is on the WASH side so that WASH is seen as contributing to integrated and improved child outcomes. So I'll conclude by saying that oh, it, it is quite exciting and, and in a world that demands more evidence and better evidence, uh, we feel that we are in a room and I actually feel that I'm in a majority for once, you know, where when Anna asked the question of how many people are from the WASH sector, there are, I think that counted for the majority. But that's great because we do want to work alongside health, alongside nutrition as, as you know, having that collective voice to have an integrated approach to planning, 
to financing, to resourcing, and to delivery, where the outcome is improved child health. It's not just about taps and toilets, or it's not just about kitchens or number of children fed, but it's about what it's leading to in terms of outcomes. So thank you very much, and look forward to continued cooperation and working on this. Thanks, Girish. That was, that was um, really great, and I think we'll come back to some of those um, uh, points. The, 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 last, the last member of uh, the, the, the panel, who, apart from being my, uh, my boss, uh, is also uh, Professor Sandy Cairncross, who's a professor of environmental health here at the, uh, the London School. Um, Sandy's a, uh, it's a really nice line. He's a, he's a public health engineer by uh, profession and an epidemiologist uh, by um, vocation. Uh, I'm not going to read all the things that Sandy's done, but I do want to highlight that Sandy's a, a fairly um, uh, rare thing in the, in, in the world of um, high-powered academia, in that he split his career almost evenly, maybe two-thirds, one-third, uh, between, between doing uh, a high, uh, uh, really pushing the boundaries on the science, at the same time as also working at the, uh, at the shop end uh, in uh, the delivery of services, and uh, most notably, uh, traveled to uh, Mozambique and worked there uh, for seven years in the early, early 1980s. Um, uh, Sandy also is probably the only person to have received uh, an OBE uh, for his contribution to uh, the safe management of excreta. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, as you think about putting uh, by appointment uh, on the uh, business card. Um, uh, well, Ollie threw down the challenge to, to Girish to say, well, you know, what have what people done for, for nutrition? And I think maybe broadening the, the, the challenge a bit, we could say more than you think, and more than they think, because there are lots of impacts, and let me just suggest one more that didn't really go into Alan's review. I spent some time in the 90s working on the eradication of guinea worm disease, which is a water-borne disease, which is almost almost eradicated, the dangerous thing to say, but it, from something like three million cases in the 70s in the world, we're now down to less than a thousand, and there will be four countries. Um, but uh, I had a colleague who uh, was able to see the difference between the parts of Nigeria in the 1970s where there was most guinea worm and the parts where there was relatively little because you could see that the cultivated area per head of population was greater where there wasn't guinea worm because guinea worm, when you have it, is disabling at just the time of year, the rainy season, when you have to be out working in the fields. Um, so it must be one of the very few diseases whose impact you can see from space. Um, but he certainly uh, found some support for that, that thesis. Um, so uh, with the guinea worm almost gone, there's a benefit from wash or from water supply particularly, which has already been bestowed for all the 2.99 whatever million it is who didn't have guinea worm this year, who would have if they'd been living in the 70s. Um, but I, I want to just look back a little bit uh, his, in, in recent history in another way. Um, when I first started working on the health impacts of water and sanitation, the big names to conjure with interested in the health impact were very often nutritionists. There were people like Leonardo Mata in Central America, Andrew Tompkins here in Bloomsbury at the Institute of Child Health, and, and also at the school, um, were looking at nutritional impact quite directly. Quite, um, they, they saw that that was certainly one area that needed documentation. And in fact, the first person to do what we might call a systematic review of the health benefits of water and sanitation, the late Stephen Esri. Um, at that time, the systematic review was still waiting really to be invented, and the name systematic review didn't, didn't exist, wasn't part of common currency. But he was a nutritionist working with Jean-Pierre Habicht at Cornell University, and his interest was particularly in nutrition, and he developed a rather interesting theory that uh, studies of the nutritional impact might be less sub subject to some kinds of bias than studies of diarrheal disease. 
Um, more recently, um, we found bias problems uh, come and plagued us uh, again in a different way from the studies of household water treatment looking at water quality improvements. We were able to look at a few of these studies which were blinded so that people didn't know whether they were benefiting from the quality intervention or not. And in those, some, somehow the effect, the benefit of the water quality improvement uh, disappeared. So there seems to be some placebo effect, some psychological effect whereby people, if they think they're in a more healthy environment, they seem to notice their ill health less. Um, now this raises questions for all the other literature we've been working on in the WASH field, for example, studies of hygiene promotion and, and sanitation because you, you certainly can't do a blinded study of sanitation. You can't get people to use a latrine without their knowledge. Um, so, so one may be able to blind the study in terms of the objective but not the, um, the allocation. So again, as Steve Edry turned to nutrition in the hope of eliminating some bias, we're coming back to nutrition again. There's, there's, we're, in a sense, r repeating the cycle because we need outcomes which are less subject to psychological biases and it's hoped that nutritional status measured objectively on the, in terms of anthropometry and child growth will be a more reliable <coughs> measure. Uh, and so we have great hopes of, of, of nutritional and nutritional status is one of the outcomes that Girish mentioned as being studied in the ERISA trial of sanitation which is currently underway. So I don't see the, the work of Alan as, as completely coming out of the blue. I think it's in a long tradition of distinguished work on the relation between water, sanitation and nutrition and I look forward to more collaboration with him. Thank you. Um, Alan, would you mind joining us? Right. Um, I think we, 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 we have got a mic. We've got microphones. Um, let's, what I suggest you do is to take a round of questions and then I'll throw them uh, to the panel. If your question hasn't been answered, you let the panel know about it. Um, okay, so any, any questions or points that people want to raise? Yep, at the back. Um. Hi everyone. Uh, I hope I can be a little critical. Uh, <laughs> I'm not a. I'm not coming from the nutrition side or the wash side. So I, I come from a methodological perspective. So I'm a little confused about the argument that you're making, uh, which is basically you're saying that okay, uh, wash interventions and wash related interventions can produce. Uh, there's no evidence to show that uh, there's a weight for age benefit, but there is about a 0.5 centimeter benefit in terms of height for age, which could might as well be zero. And uh, this is an overestimate. This could also be an overestimated benefit because of the risk of bias. Okay, blinding, I understand that uh, the people could not have been blinded, but I'm pretty sure the outcome assessors could have been blinded. So if, uh, because a 0.5 benefit is like uh, on the stereometer, okay, are you one, one meter five? five centimeter more or five centimeters, I can really adjust that on the stereometer. It's not a difficult thing to adjust by knowing whether the person is coming from the uh, intervention arm or the control arm. So, yeah. Thank you. Alan, do you want to... Do we... Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, if you could just say where, uh, well, your name, but where, where you're from. Yeah. Um, I'm Manu Matthew. I'm a MSA, a public health MSc student from LSSCM. Okay, thank you, Manu. Uh, okay, we'll take. I think we'll take one more from the, the gentleman at the back. Yeah, the, the beard. I, I work with Plan International, and my name is Unni Krishna. So this question is not related with Plan because we don't have 100 million dollars to spend next week. But if I win the lotto this weekend, and if I get 100 million dollars, and if I want to see children more healthy. Should I give the money to what rate or should I give the money to people who work on agricultural issues? Because I've seen evidence that shows uh, if you improve good yield and good agriculture and distribution system, it improves 
the nutritional status. But I've seen the evidence in the past. But the first presentation really makes me to think, should we be putting money into sanitation at all? I don't have under hundred million dollars, but if I get this week, and I will certainly be will be struggling with this. Yeah. Okay. If you leave your address, and we'll, uh, I think Alan, I'm going to pass it to you, and then we'll we'll go along. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on hello, Hi. So um, the first question uh, is a very interesting question. Thank you for that. Um, you raised questions about the scale of the effect, the size of the effect, which I agree is, is small. Um, and you raised questions about the quality of the evidence and specifically about blinding. So um, if I do blinding first, the, it is difficult to blind the interventions and theoretically, of course, it's very possible to blind outcome assessors. Um, I think it's true to say that in some cases that was done and in some cases that wasn't done. And that's a shortcoming of the evidence base. Um, if you look at the, some of the studies, especially the studies on sodas, solar disinfectants of, uh, solar disinfection of water, the, uh, it is not at all clear that the outcome assessors were blinded. And that's, you know, that's part of the Cochrane process is to really delve down and look at the quality of the evidence and do we really believe it. And I think, you know, I gave, you know, Ollie commented on my talk as a, you know, it, that I, I tried to give an academic's talk which was presenting the evidence that we collected. And I think it's really important to do that because I don't, and I left it to the other distinguished panel members to to interpret that and put it in a policy space. So uh, the evidence could be stronger. It would be lovely if it was stronger, but there's still quite a lot of evidence and it's suggestive of an impact, a small impact, but an impact. And it might also be that, of course, you know, if Robert Chambers was here, he would say, um, as he did, we, we gave a talk together uh, in the House of Lords to the all-party parliamentary group on child health, and he there said, well, actually, this might be an underestimate of the size of the impact, um, and it might be even more if this was rolled out at scale. So, you know, what, I'm, what I did was present the evidence as it is. Um, I'm not going to answer the question on whether or not it's more important to do wash or agriculture. Um, I might just say that because I sit in the agriculture team uh, at, the, at DFID, that investment in agriculture is really important. Um, but I, I also think it's important reflecting on the strength of the evidence in agriculture. So there have been some systematic reviews looking at the strength of evidence linking agricultural innovations with nutrition and health outcomes. The strongest evidence by far comes from by fortified crops. These are crops which are selected um, uh, typically through uh, standard farming practices, not through bioengineering, but through standard farming practices selected to have improved nutrition content. And the evidence is very clear from those studies and there have been, there have been trials now, good quality randomized control trials. Not only the evidence is clear that if children eat these, these foods such as uh, orange flesh sweet potato which is rich in pro-vitamin A, uh, that not only if they eat it that their vitamin A status increase, increases, but if you give the seed to farmers and they plant it, then the vitamin A status of populations improves. So there is good quality evidence in some specific innovations in agriculture. I think your question more broadly about is it sensible to invest in WASH or is it sensible to invest in agriculture is incredibly difficult to answer. I'm not sure we have the answer, but maybe Girish does. <laughs> I just say only question we need to talk. <laughs> uh, I, I think this uh, it, it's a real challenge, I suppose, if you're looking at it from a national government perspective, and this is typically what a finance minister or permanent secretary of finance would face when he gets competing demands or she gets competing demands from different ministries in terms of who, is, who, who needs it more than uh, somebody else. I think uh, there is definitely an argument which Alan talked about and, and he's much better placed to give the evidence of more food and therefore more improvement on nutrition. There are equity issues in there. In, if that was the case, then, you know, for example, if you take the case of India, which, which is quoted by Robert Chambers in his sanitation and stunting discussion, you know, some of the better off states should see, you know, better nutrition levels, which is not often the case because there, is, there are underpinning inequity issues that we need to address. But at the end of it, 
is also trying to say, you know, how can we put these arguments together? Because at the end of the day, if the outcome is about improved child health and improved nutrition, how do we look at these different determinants of uh, improved health and nutrition? And, and obviously, there are some choices to be made. The World Bank has done a study which shows that uh, in India, for instance, 6% of the GDP is lost because of poor sanitation and health. And they've done it across several other countries, Sub-Saharan African countries, South Asian countries. The range is from 2 to 7%. So I suppose we need to get all these things and try to figure out what might be that optimal uh, mix of, of allocation of resources towards improved child, out, uh, child health and nutrition outcomes. I think it's also important to bear in mind the context because the context can vary enormously. So in peri-urban communities where people are buying water from vendors for household use, they're typically spending 20% of the household income on the water bought from those vendors. And so that if you can make water available to people more cheaply, you're producing, a, a, you're potentially supplementing the household income. In fact, it's more than just a 20% supplement to the household income. You're supplementing that part of the income which goes to the wife for household use, which is therefore available also for food. And the, the proportion is probably still greater because the income elasticity of demand for water is so low that the poorest households are spending more than 20% of their income on water. So you're, it's a targeted benefit to the poorest households if you can do it. That's just one example. And looking in rural areas, a lot will depend on population density, cash crop prices, um, you know, what the opportunities are, the degree to which the uh, wealthier landowners will skim off the income made. So you can't abdicate responsibility for a local assessment of, of local condition. Thanks. Um, really good questions to kick us off. Thank you. Um, the, first, the first point um, that was made about effects being very small is, of course, absolutely right, um, and also only effects on height for age. Um, but I think we need to set that in the context of what we know about what works to tackle stunting and the fact that actually all the things which we know work all individually have very small effects. And the point is that we need to do lots of things um, at once to ha really have a, a big impact. That's the big challenge, and it's a big challenge for the evidence because we're, we're so, we, you know, rightly constrained by looking at individual interventions and their impact on specific outcomes, which is a very narrow way of looking at a problem and a solution. And I think we have to keep that in mind, that challenge of, of, of how we deal with the evidence and gather it. Um, I think the other point around where do you put your $100 million is, um, again, a, a, an excellent question because it's one that many, many countries are facing. Um, and I think we've got a few challenges here. One is around metrics in that the agriculture sector is typically, as Alan said, the evidence base is actually pretty weak in agriculture in terms of looking at nutritional outcomes. And, but we know lots about, you know, because agriculture in, interventions are typically um, evaluated in terms of um, poverty reduction or um, growth in um, economic growth yields and so forth. The metrics are very different from in public health and that's a bit of a, a bit of a, um, a challenge for trying to and why these kinds of exercises of building bridges between different disciplines are so important. Um, but also I think because of the wider value, so you might start out with thinking well I, I want to tackle stunting but of course agriculture is going to deliver a whole wide range of other benefits in addition to potentially reducing stunting and the same could be said um, for WASH. So I think, you know, there's a question about how we capture value of investments um, in complex ways in, in, in terms of the value that they actually deliver. And I kind of wonder whether the answer to your question is really, well, actually, I'd put 50 million into each in the same place. 
and try and actually get more value from a combined investment in a kind of more concentrated way. I think we need to start thinking a little bit more about the implications of that, of, of, of layering investments a bit more strategically in populations that are really high risk of multiple deprivations and, and how we, what that means for policy makers. Can I just very quickly add something? I, I, was just, I just suddenly remembered. Um, we published this some time ago, and it was written even longer ago. Um, but I taught the MSc students um, on Monday, about yesterday, about growth, and identified and highlighted to them the importance of the first two years of life um, in, in determining growth performance, in setting the speed of growth, and also the likely end point of adult height which reminded me that we did some subgroup analysis, and I didn't present subgroup analysis because I always think it's important to present the primary analysis, but in the subgroup analysis we did, we showed that um, where we split, we looked at the, uh, the effect of the interventions by age group, and we split it as under two and more than two years of age, the effect was largely restricted to, uh, to children under the age of two. So what interventions in children under the age of two um, had, a, had a, the, the size effect, the mean difference, it was 0.25 standard deviations, so a quarter of a standard deviation, so more than double, so that's a, more than a centimetre in difference. So the effect is going to be different by age group, and, and, and as we get more information, those analyses will be even more robust. We've got three more questions, but in, I'm just going to um, pick on uh, a, a DFID colleague. So we actually do have a member of the DFID WASH team sitting at the back. I was wondering if... Um, Simon, whether you could comment, because as I understand it, DFID is about to spend about approximately 100 uh, million uh, pounds um, on water sanitation and hygiene. And I'm just wondering to what extent uh, you see that contributing to, uh, you know, to, to nutrition and being coordinated with the work of, of, of Anna. I'm very sorry to put you on the spot like this. How oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you, Alan. Thanks uh, very much for uh, being given this opportunity to uh, uh, waffle a bit and feel a bit embarrassed. Um, I think we are tremendously committed to the idea of working much more closely together, and I think recognizing how difficult that is, not just in terms of uh, breaking down the silos within our own organization, but, but then starting to work with uh, the different organizations and, and making sure that there are um, good cross-sectoral learning and uh, particularly as, as you, I think a lot of you will know we do, a lot of our investment in WASH goes through UNICEF and so the opportunity for working cross-sector there is, is very strong because of course um, we're not just working in WASH with UNICEF, we're working with, in nutrition, health, um, education and I think uh, we now have a real impetus as far as early childhood development is concerned. I think, you know, for me, that first thousand days, which you, Alan, was just alluding to, and which I think Anna has made a you know, really big case for in, at, at DFID, I think there's a really big movement in, as far as uh, DFID is concerned to push that. Now, you're alluding to the, the, the results challenge fund that's uh, out there at the moment, and there's quite a few people probably sitting in this room who have spent a lot of time and energy and effort to uh, develop proposals for that. So um, I can't uh, sneak any inside information on that because I'm, I'm not in the picture on that. But I, I think what we hope is that, yes, that there will be a, a commitment on the part of those people who are trying to deliver results um, that they are results that don't just look at access to water and sanitation and hygiene, but look how that impacts on early childhood development, how it impacts on on the on the on the early years, and, and how it contributes to the, the whole picture of of how nutrition it plays out. And I, I think our understanding is improving. And I, I think you know this paper that um, or this work that the Cochrane Review is, is very very significant in saying. This is, it's, we understand that there's, there's a proportion there and we've got to work on that and maybe the environmental enteropathy will be big and give us some more information but we recognize that the level of intensity required to achieve a wash impact on stunting is still probably out of our reach at the moment. So very challenging. Um, I think the answer to the question is yes, we do hope that that investment does cut across sectors and, and pulls it all together. 
thank, thanks, thanks for that. So Simon's an, an early pioneer actually in this area because he married a, a nutritionist. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I hope it's going well. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to take three questions. Uh, uh, David, uh, the, the lady uh, at the back. Uh, oh, okay, the lady next to the lady at the back, the other lady at the back, and then maybe the lady on the back row. And we w if you could be quick, and then we will have time for the other, the other people to uh, ask their questions. Uh, yes, we'll start there, and then we'll come back. Um, hello, my name's Rosie. I'm a pediatrician. Um, I know of some people who are starting to try to tease out this link between pathogen exposure and um, malnutrition and stunting um, using um, RCTs of antibiotics. Um, and um, I was just wondering what the panel thought about the role of these, if they're found to be beneficial, um, is this just something that's going to tell us more about the biology, um, is this just a stopgap measure, um, or will this be one of the multiple interventions one day? <coughs> okay. Um, uh, I'm going to, David, are you able to do it without the microphone? Yes. Yeah. Um, my more methodological question. And it seems to me very often in complex situations, um, Cochrane reviews are tending to give quite narrow, smaller than we might have expected. Now, there are two types of explanations. One is that we deluded ourselves when we don't have proper control, and that clearly is the answer. The other question is what is happening with glucose? In quite a number of these, the number of basic trials that one starts with is huge. And by the time one has applied quite rightly one, in advanced criteria, you just a very small number. It might be something to be gained by someone going and looking systematically through the ones that have been ejected to see whether there are things going on in the process which are actually um, sort of kill, slightly killing the differential. Yeah. Okay. And then this, the, the lady at the back, the, and then we'll go to the, to the panel. Um, hello, my name is Sarah, and I'm from an organisation called ID UK. And if Plan did come across 100 million, we'd be happy to take it off your hands. Um, we work with smallholder farmers, and we're also um, introducing a lot more nutrition messaging into our programmes, and also WASH. And we have a sort of um, holistic programme that is working in Bangladesh and Nepal, and we also have a new one in, in Bangladesh as well. So we operate through a market, um, a market-based approach, and I was just wondering how you see the role of markets in terms of delivering, um, delivering wash, you know, latrines and so on, and also improving um, nutritional outcomes. Okay, great. So we've, we've got three points there. Uh, the new and exciting evidence on sort of use of antibiotics, uh, a sort of methodological reflection that you know is are we missing inf important information and insights? Uh, in the exclusion uh, process, it's an inherent part of the uh, of the review. And then, lastly, how can how can markets be used to sort of improve um, uh, outcomes in this area? Um, antibiotics. <laughs> very new and very exciting. I yeah. think. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Anna, did you want to? Be, you, Don't really. No, I think no more really. Yeah. Comment, sorry, um, but it'd be great to find out more. Okay, so consensus, new and exciting. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Alan, maybe you pick up David's point. Very happy to pick up David's. So uh, this is um, this is what happens in systematic reviews. I didn't put up the flow chart, but needless to say, we started off with 20,458 studies, papers, or reports, or books, or something that we had to look through. And we ended up with uh, 14 studies which were included in the review, five of which were randomized controlled trials included in meta-analysis. So that is what happens when you do systematic reviews. You start off with an enormous uh, trawl and you try and pull out what there is. So we're, we're relatively confident. No, that's not true. We, are, we think we've got lots of the evidence. Um, we don't think we've got it all. And one of the things we learned when we did this was actually, um, well, all uh, of the five studies that we included in our meta-analysis, only one of them reported its nutrition data, its growth data, has reported it, has, used, has analyzed it and reported it. The other four, we asked the authors for the raw data and we included it and they sent us the raw data and we then could include it in meta-analysis. So what that tells us is that there are probably 
a large number of other studies which we haven't been able to identify uh, despite a huge amount of effort. Uh, you know, we spoke to endless amounts of authors and we went all sorts of fora and everything. Uh, so there are probably a lot, several other studies where there are data which we haven't got in this, in this review. Um, I'm, I'm confident, you know, when we, if you read the review, we report it all very fairly. So the meta-analysis tends to focus always on the, on the system, on the, on the, on the randomized control trials because that's the most robust data. But we report every single study fairly. We report the finding. Um, and the finding from the other studies is mixed. Some show an effect, some don't show an effect. But some are very, 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 um, extremely poor quality. So I wouldn't really want to include them in a meta-analysis and I wouldn't really necessarily believe what they say. So our meta-analysis is cautious, I think you're right, um, and may have, but, but, but I'm also, we're also aware that we may have missed some of the other data. Sorry, Dan. Did you yeah. that more? Oh yes, markets. Um, we played a role, I think it's fair to say, in persuading the World Bank Water and Sanitation Program and the World Bank to work much more with a marketing approach in sanitation programs in a number of countries. Um, I wrote a brochure which was published by the World Bank in 1992 and they then forgot it for about 10 years. But um, later a colleague went from here to the bank and drew this to the attention of some of the sanitation people who, who started digging out more copies out of a box down in the basement and applying it. Um, so that, that's one area. Another area where we work with markets is of a rather different kind is in, san in, in hygiene promotion where we've worked with soap manufacturers, large multinational ones and also smaller local ones in, in various countries working through the trade associations and getting the help of the marketing people in soap companies to promote not their brand of soap but the, the, the idea of using soap for hand washing as a, as a hygiene intervention and the dream which we nurture is that one day, and we, I think we're getting quite close to it, but we hope to get to the point where the soap companies become well enough convinced of the advantage of promoting hand washing in their own commercial interest that we shall have self-sustaining hygiene promotion, self-financing. Uh, I think there are a lot more opportunities. The market involved in sanitation is one of small local producers and masons, but I think there, there is room to remedy the market failure which has happened in most of the third world where big companies don't want to get associated with sanitation. But if we can persuade one large company to get involved in sanitation production and, and promotion, then I think it'll catch on very quickly in a lot of other countries because they realize what enormous revenue there is to be made, even from the poor. Thank you, Sandy. And just to add on to what Sandy said, uh, you know, it, it's also being tried out in terms of menstrual hygiene management because the whole issue is about the supply side constraint and how do you use market to actually address the supply side constraint. So whether it's about improved technology, lightweight pans that people can buy in the local market and transport it easily, what are those constraints that the market can address? And I think organizations like IDE has an immense role to see how, you know, we can contribute to the solution. Urbanization is obviously now a very big issue and, and one of the big challenges we are facing is on having the right kind of technology and operators to undertake fecal sludge management because otherwise you might end up stopping open defecation and people having you know one place where they defecate but then what do you do with that and if that's not managed well it leads to a larger environmental sanitation problem but the challenge is you know